So we are playing in the Forgotten Realms, which is one of the many sort of worlds that you can sort of buy prepackaged in Dungeons and Dragons. And for new players, you can invent things completely from scratch. You can make up your own world, you can make up your own adventures and do all that sort of thing. In this case, I'm going to be running a pre-made adventure just because I'm kind of busy and I don't have time to invent all this stuff. I will be playing the role of the Dungeon Master. I control the game and control all the sort of the monsters and the non-player characters, give quests, give rewards, that sort of thing. I am not playing against the players. Uh, we are all sort of playing together to create the story. I just happen to be sort of the main narrator. My goal is to try to ensure that everyone has fun. That being said, because I have I have played D&D for a really long time and sort of an old school D&D player, I often like to play up a sort of adversarial, adversarial kind of role between the DM and the players. Hey, Mboer123, thank you very much for subscribing. Uh, Taki can't access the rogue. Right, I probably need to change that. There you go, you should be able to do it now. Um... So, you know, I might play up a sort of competitiveness going on here, but I'm not actually trying to kill everyone in the party. Uh, hopefully we will have fun. That being said, I am not one of these soft cuddling DMs where it's impossible to ever die. Death is always an option, especially in a one shot sort of adventure like this. So we're going to do this box set or this pre-made adventure, probably just deal with part one, which is set in the Forgotten Realms. It's a sort of an area of like very high magic, high fantasy sort of thing. Who else just subscribed? My God, I'm not going to be able to get through this introduction. <gasps> Bane Kid 96. No, I'm I do appreciate all the support, especially when we're doing weird stuff like this that not necessarily gonna get a whole lot of audience. Specifically, we are starting on the West Coast, the Sword Coast near Neverwinter. Of course, if you've ever played a game like Neverwinter Nights or um Baldur's Gate is set in a similar kind of area, I think the area might be a little bit familiar to you. Now, specifically, we're gonna be dealing with an area called Fandalin. This is a small town that you are traveling to now. Uh in fact. The, the basic sort of adventure setup for this, just a very simple hook, is the party. You guys were all in, actually Neverwinter. You're all uh, new adventurers. You haven't really gotten a whole lot of experience under your belt. Maybe you have some sort of background, which explains why you might be able to, you know, fight a little bit, or <coughs> you're, you're especially good at um, doing thieving kind of stuff, or, or, or spell casting. So you've had a little bit of experience, but you're new to being adventurous. You don't have a reputation yet, and, you know, it's a big, scary world out there, and this is sort of your first time going out. So you went to Neverwinter, and maybe you you, you signed up at some sort of a adventurer's guild or a bar or you saw a posting or whatever, and you were hired for a simple, simple job. Obviously, nothing could possibly go wrong. Um... You uh, there's there's a you got a job from someone named Gundren Rockseeker. He's a dwarf, sort of a dwarf. Um, I don't know, entrepreneur a little bit. And uh, he uh, he needs you to escort a wagon to Fandalin. Um, he's gone off ahead uh, ahead of you guys uh, with a, with a friend of his. They're going to go and set things up. But you've got a wagon to carry. It's got a variety of like just more or less generic supplies for this town and it looks like i don't know you're getting a sense maybe there's some pickaxes or something like that maybe there's a bit of a mining operation in there which you could have asked him about or could not have it doesn't really matter but that's your job there's lots of brigands you're going it's a little bit into the wilderness into the wild uh this is a very small new town actually built on the ruins of an old one we'll get into that a little bit later on um and so they're worried about bandits and brigands and goblins and orcs and things like that along the way. So they're going to pay you guys uh, 10 gold pieces each upon arrival safely with the wagon. And uh, that's where we're going to pick up. Elder on Wise. Thank you. Or Elder on Wise. I don't know how to parse these names sometimes. Thank you for subscribing. I appreciate it. So, um, so yeah. So you guys can... Uh, oh, yeah. You're delivering it specifically to Barthen's Provisions. That's where you're trying to go. It's the trading post in town. That's where you're trying to deliver the goods. So you're going to get a, a small fee for being able to escort that uh, securely. So um, you guys will have traveled on the road for a few days. So go ahead and sort of, you know, talk amongst each other, introduce yourselves to one another. Uh, maybe some of you guys knew each other from something like well in the past. Maybe you met up in Neverwinter and did a little bit of stuff in uh, in Neverwinter, uh, or maybe this is literally like the first time you met each other was on the morning when the wagon was heading out. So so go ahead and talk amongst yourselves a minute. And while I say much Greetings. love to El Superbeardo and Rayu. Hmm. So uh, Just, yeah, Briarstone, go ahead. Yeah, greetings, uh, everyone. Happen to be new faces here. My name is Tosniog Magic Bird. 
<clears throat> really? And I'm pleased to meet all of you. Would you like I'm to introduce Kosh yourself? I'm Koshy Sedge. I'm Jasor Alidus, and I just set out on an adventure, and this is my first time meeting all of you. <laughs> uh, what about, uh, you might want to mention your, your sort of race uh, and uh, profession, you know, class, that sort of thing. I'm a high elven wizard, and I'm a sage, so I'm trying to solve a mystery of a dead friend and an old arcane tome, and that's what brought me on my adventure. Okay. And do you think that um, this mission to Fandelver or Fandalen will help that, or are you just trying to raise a few funds for some further research, maybe? Well, I don't really know what I'm doing, so uh, it might help, or it might just give me funds, which would help too. All right. And that was, uh, sorry, who's the wizard? Oh, up there, JSOR. Right, okay. Okay, so we've got we've got one warrior, one rogue, one cleric, one wizard, and then an extra warrior on top of that. So we've got one of everything and two warriors. Um, the other warrior, I think, is is Portia, right? Yes. Now, what type of warrior are you? What kind of armor are you wearing? Are you sort of a tough frontline fighter or what? Uh, uh I'm well. I'm I'm Portia Dale said. I I'm a halfling fighter. Uh I come from a a small small village um very very simple folks i i was a shepherdess previously and um i when some brigands attacked my village i i stood up and and led the militia against them and and sort of felt that being able to help other people like that was more my calling than uh, just tending flocks of sheep. Um, I, I'm a frontline fighter. Um, I oh, fight, that's good. I fight with a rapier and a shield. Um, I, I use my dexterity for uh, getting in precise hits rather than strength, but I, I, I fight with uh, with a shield to block attacks against my allies. Uh, and I I have chain armor, so I, I can take take a few hits. Okay. I, I was worried at first when I'm like, okay, so one of our fighters has a strength of six and the other fighter is a halfling. This is gonna be <laughs> awesome. Oh God. <laughs> I'm sure it's gonna be fine. I think it's going to be I fine. Will hide behind other people. I'm just saying. No, I do have an AC of 18, so... Oh, oh nice! Wow. Okay, you're gonna be nigh on wow. untouchable in this thing. In fact, I also think though uh, that Perrin, our archer... Uh, no, sorry, not our archer, our cleric, I think has a very high AC as well. Yeah, 18. Yeah, that's good. You, you might have to double as a bit of a frontline fighter uh, uh, as well. Uh, I don't know how much you've looked into the rules, Perrin, but you have two potential casting or healing spells that you can cast. One is Cure Wounds. It requires you to touch someone and use your full action to do it. Uh, the other one is Healing Word, and, the, and what's cool about that is you get to do it at a distance, if I recall correctly, and it's a bonus action, um, which means it doesn't. you can still take a normal action that turn, so you can attack and then use your Healing Word to heal at the same time. It heals less, but it's quite handy, especially if you're a frontline type of fighter. Nice. Oh, oh yeah, what's the uh, thaumaturgy? The thaumaturgy, uh, so if you open up the basic rules PDF, which you should definitely have sort of handy, you can look up that spell. Thaumaturgy is like, um, it's a miscellaneous spell that lets you make like little tiny effects. Um, if I opened up my own copy over here, which I should have had ready ahead of time. We're going to look into that. Yeah, I'm trying to look into it. <laughs> God, so many spells. Yeah. So <laughs> thaumaturgy is not like an important sort of battle spell. It's just a really cool one that does all kinds of little stuff all the time. So um, 
it, uh, it it lasts up to a minute, and it can do the following sorts of things. Your voice booms up to three times as loud. Uh, you cause flames to flicker, brighten, dim, or change color. You cause harmless tremors in the ground. You create instantaneous sound that originates from a point of your choice within range, such as the rumble of thunder, the cry of a raven, or ominous whispers. You instantly cause an unlocked door or window to fly open or slam shut. Or you can alter the appearance of your eyes for one minute. So little, little tiny kind of magic-y effects, you know? If you want to put on a, a magic show and freak people out or make people think a house, house is haunted, you can woo, do things like that. So it's, a not, it's not a combat spell. It's just like the funnest spell in the entire book. Oh, fair enough. People are in chat are asking what AC is. AC stands for armor class. So the way combat will work is very simple. Um, to attack, you roll a 20-sided die. And then you add some some amount of bonus to it. The bonus will depend partially on, on who you are and what your stats are, for example. But it might be around plus four or plus five at this level. Okay, let's say it's plus five. So you roll a 20-sided die, you add five. And that has to equal or exceed the armor class of your enemy to hit. So an armor class of 18 is quite tough because people are going to have to roll like 13 or 14 or worse. I don't know what that was. Um, to, um, to land a blow. And that, you know, that starts, so they're only going to hit maybe about roughly a quarter of the time or something like that. So an 18 is pretty tough, especially since most of the enemies won't actually have that good of an R uh, to hit bonus compared to the players. So, um, all right, let's, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Hmm. Sounds good. So here's, here's the backstory. In the city of Neverwinter, a dwarf named Gundren Rockseeker asked you to bring a wagon load of provisions to the rough and tumble settlement of Fandalin, a couple of days' travel southeast of the city. Gundren was clearly excited and more than a little secretive about his reasons for the trip, saying only that he and his brothers had found something big, and that he'd pay you ten gold pieces each, ten real gold pieces. It's not a huge amount of money necessarily, but it is not bad. It'll keep you going for a bit. Um, Ten gold pieces each for escorting his supplies safely to Barthen's Provisions, a trading post in Fandalin. He then set out ahead of you on horse, along with a warrior escort named Sildur Hallwinter, claiming he needed to arrive early to take care of business. You spent the last few days following the high road south from Neverwinter, and you've just recently veered east along the Tribor Trail. You've encountered no trouble so far, but this territory can be dangerous. Bandits and outlaws have been known to lurk along the trail. So uh, what I'd like to know at this point is, um, well, a couple of things. I mean, does anyone, you know, does anyone have any comments or anything that they want to bring up at this point? But uh, other than that, we'll have to establish a marching order. How are you guys walking down here? It's a relatively narrow trail going along Fandalian at this point. Uh, basically just wide enough for the, the wagon and, and definitely very bumpy. It doesn't specify what the wagon is being pulled with. I'm going to say... Um, Couple of oxen? Sure. We'll use oxen. They're they're infinitely less sexy than horses, but they work really well in this sort of rough terrain because they'll kind of go through anything. Who is driving the oxen there? That's an excellent idea. An excellent question. Um well, I have some skill in vehicle, although it's chariots, although if anybody doesn't have anything better than that, I could probably I have pull a wagon. Off. There you go. Now, here's the thing. In, in this day and age... some knowledge of animal handling. Oh, there you go. So in this day and age, everyone knows how to ride a horse and operate a wagon. It's just like, it's just kind of everyday knowledge sort of stuff. So you don't need anything special for that. But if you do have the wagon proficiency, um, that means that if anything happens, you will get to add a proficiency bonus to your role to like, you know, stay on the road or whatever. And I'm going to say that animal handling probably applies to that as well. So either one of you guys can be uh, operating. Guys or girls. Well, if anybody else can, I would rather them do that because I really don't like being in the front. Actually, I don't like anybody being behind me either. So, so just kind of... Just, well, I, I'll I, probably be near the back. Since I'm the um, fighter with the good AC and everything, I think having me in the front would be a smart thing to do. Alright, so we've got uh, Briarstone's character in the back. We've got um, Portia in the front. And who was driving? Perrin? Yeah. Perrin right, with the I'm wagon driving. skill. <laughs> I'm curious where the rogue might be in all this. In with the goods? Yeah, just hiding under the blankets, having a nap. It's like, look at all the loots. I'll just rest here. 
Uh, Serafina is pissed because she hasn't had second breakfast. <laughs> Just realize I'm getting a bit of noise on my camera here. Let me see if I can improve that slightly. Mm. So, so how how many Hobbit slash Lord of the Rings uh, references are you going to make on the halfling? Well, unfortunately, there's no dwarves around to toss, so it's going to have to be all halflings all the time. <laughs> all right. Uh, and who didn't we account for? The cleric is driving. The rogue is snoozing. The warrior is leading. The other warrior is in the back with the wizard. Uh, wizard yeah, and Briarstone I'll hold. Be the in the back. If Briar wants to be all the way in back, I'll just be right in front of him. All right. Good. Good to know. <clears throat> You've been on the Tribor Trail for about half a day. As you come around a bend, you spot a burnt out, destroyed wagon on the path several feet ahead of you, 50 feet ahead of you, uh, blocking the path. Uh, the wagon has several black feathered arrows sticking out of it. The woods press close to the trail here with a steep embarkment and dense thickets on either side. Um, just in the first sight of it, if I could, I know we haven't rolled initiative or anything because there's nothing to roll initiative to, but is there any way that I can just, um, get into some foliage or something? So, yeah, you're looking to get into the, the bush, the trees on the side. Yeah, I don't want to be in the middle of the road, basically. Okay. Just out of curiosity, do you have a, do you have a, like, are you looking to hide or are you just looking for cover or what? I have the ability to... What is it called there? It's called Mask of the Wild can attempt to hide while obscured. So if I can get into some leaves or if it happens to be heavy raining or anything that happens to be, even sunlight beams. If there's a bunch right. of dancing sunlight beams, I can hide in amongst that sort of thing. Yeah, so I mean, obviously anyone can hide if they've got some amount of cover, foliage, or they're behind a tree or something like that. But as a wild elf, you need even less of it if there's any sort of natural phenomena sort of going around. You can, you can mess with it a little bit easier. So, okay, that, that'll be pretty good, actually. I I want to go and investigate the uh, the wagon. Uh, check that there's like nobody sort of there and hurt. Oh, that's a good idea. Also, as the sort of uh, the the vanguard of the party, as the uh, the burly fighter, that certainly seems like your area that you might want to go and do it. And uh, uh, Taki says maybe someone should wake up the rogue. <laughs> Well, certainly oh, your, yeah, your yeah, own wagon will come to a halt. I'm, I'm certain that uh, Perrin, your driver, will probably have uh, reined the oxen in once this happens. Yeah. And certainly you can't continue. The wagon is kind of in the middle of the road here, so it's, it's in the way. And that'll probably yeah. wake up the rogue, if nothing else. Uh, can I use perception to see if I sense or see anything wrong? Sure. Why don't everyone, uh, if you guys want, certainly you'd probably want to all do a perception check at this point. All right. So go ahead and roll in the chat. You can do that by, yeah, you do the slash roll and then the die, which would be 1d20 plus your wisdom modifier for perception. And if you are proficient in perception, you can also add your proficiency bonus. So it's a wisdom ability check where you can add your perception proficiency if you have it. I, I like how Porsche's got the minus one. Wisdom. Uh, wait, no. Yeah. Wisdom, not her thing. <laughs> Yeah, sort of. This, a, this is a, also why she's like, "Yes, let's go rushing into the wagon." I don't care that there's arrows. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, stab first, ask questions later. <laughs> exactly. Whoa, combat Zerg, Zerg playing the cleric. I guess the cleric has the higher vantage point uh, from from being on top of the wagon, and uh, as such, is able to see over a fallen log and note the presence of a goblin behind it, drawing a short bow. Now we need initiative as you guys are being ambushed. Go ahead and do your initiative check. Meanwhile, I will load up the next scene. Presumably, if I can actually box select. There we go. Copy these guys. Boom. So initiative roll is, again, a d20. And you would add, it's your dexterity modifier by default. Just arranging what we've got here. Thanks. 
I am tripping out on mushrooms in the grass. Shouldn't have hid behind those leaves then. Now, am I wrong or is there not an issue of tracker in this thing? I thought there was. But maybe there is a turn order thing. I'm not sure how you get it. I don't uh, DM on World 20, but I know it exists. Yeah. I've used it in the past. Oh, you know why? It's probably because I I'm keep using the wrong uh the wrong view here. There we go. I'm beginning to think this entire thing is doomed for me because I have been rolling low <laughs> ever since I started rolling anything for this campaign. So the only person who's not going to be surprised here is going to be Perrin, the cleric. Everyone else is going to be surprised, unfortunately, and not get to act in the first combat round. Um, isn't that still Perrin's uh, perception roll? Oh, no, wait. It's, it's 14. Zerg rolled a 14 on initiative. Yeah. All right, so Zerg's got a 14. What, what else is everyone's roll here? Uh, Briarstone's got a 6. You don't have to say it out loud. hockey has got a 13. <laughs> or Serafina, I should say. I should use everyone's character's name. Um, Portia's got a 14. jsor has got a 10. And then I have to make some rolls over here. For the goblins! So goblins, of course, are small uh, humanoids. They're tiny little critters. I mean, not like, you know tiny little fairies or anything like that. They're probably about three feet tall, four feet tall. And they're nasty, evil things, generally speaking. Um, cool! Someone who's my height. Whoa! Two of them are moving extremely fast. A four... 21... 22. Oh, not that you guys should actually know how many there are. My bad. And we're going to do numerically descending. Although I suppose you will know very, very quickly how many are there. As they start to attack. So yes, indeed, these goblins have been lying in wait, setting an ambush. Oh, did I? Sorry, I forgot to actually move you guys to the new scene. Let's do that right now. I was going to say, I don't see anything. Boop. There we go. There you have it. So this is the scene. So we've got row up by the wagon. I didn't put our wagon on the board, although I suppose I could do that pretty easily. Um, maybe you guys are going to want to end up using it for cover or something of that nature. Let's see what I can find here. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. I was yep. just noticing my mic wasn't actually responding, but apparently it is. Good. Do, 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 do. Destroy. Giant Walking of Doom. Bring that around over here. I'm not going to put the oxen down. There's your wagon. Actually, we'll put, uh, we can put Taki inside of it. There we go. To get started. Okay, there we go. That's a pretty good start. So, first thing that's going to happen is a Goblin is going to reveal itself. Just to the south of you, in the bushes, a goblin comes out and starts firing upon you with a crossbow. It's going to fire... Um, it's actually going to fire on Perrin, because Perrin, this is the one that you spotted, and who spotted you sort of at the same time over here. So the goblins are not... They're not combat monsters. They're not, like, horribly, like, horribly dangerous. But with four of them, and you guys are level one characters... Theoretically, they could actually take one of you guys out if they focused fire. Now, are they going to be smart enough to do that? We'll see. Roll a d20, uh, plus 4 to hit. 
That is a 21 to hit against Perrin, and your AC is 18, if I recall correctly. Yep. <laughs> so, yes, a small black arrowed, or black feathered arrow streaks out from the bushes and strikes Perrin squarely in the, I don't know, something. Actually, it's going to be mostly deflected. It's not going to be a fatal blow or anything like that. Uh, but it's, it's definitely going to hurt. It'll, I don't know, I guess it stabs into you somewhere. Let's see how much damage it is, and then we'll figure out exactly uh, how bad of an attack it is. Um... Bam. Oh, you've only been hit for three points of, uh, of piercing damage. I guess it was probably more of a glancing blow. Uh, maybe cut along some of the, of the leather bits and some of the joints in your armor and left a, a scratch on your arm more than anything else. It hurts. It's definitely, you know, bleeding a little bit, but nothing to be too afraid of. In fact, I'm sure you still have more than half your hit points, so you're definitely fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That didn't sound very enthusiastic, though. <laughs> uh, I don't have the most hit points, so... <laughs> Next, from the northern bushes, another goblin appears there. And this goblin, goblin of the north. cries out with a war cry, ay -ay 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 and charges at Portia, confident that uh, he can pick on someone his own size. Oh, I love halflings. So great. So he's actually, <laughs> even though he's still got a, uh, a, a short bow in the picture here, he's actually, his short bow's on his back, and instead he's drawn a wicked-looking and somewhat rusty scimitar. Uh, you're, you're more worried about getting tetanus from this than anything else. And he's going to try to hack away at Portia with this. So this is plus four to hit. Oh, only rolls a six. It is a very, very clumsy attack. Has no chance of even coming close to Porsche. You do the, the barest little sidestep, and he mostly just hacks into the, uh, the wagon side uh, to no real effect. Next up in the initiative chain is Perrin. Perrin, you get to act this round because you made your perception check. I hmm? guess... I will be um, using my crossbow. Oh, and I guess. Um, or my short bow, ironically. And I will actually go ahead and reveal the others. Your perception check was big enough. Oops. That uh, I'm going to say that you um, you can spot them all, and then when you'll, you'll sort of know the tactical layout here, and you can make a bit of a decision. Like that. You had a really good roll, so you can see all the goblins. Hmm, let's see. The one... Yeah, I'm going to shoot an arrow at the one at the northeast of me. Okay, if you, uh, if you click and hold your mouse somewhere, you can ping the map like this. Or yeah, if you use the, uh, the distance tool, you can do stuff like that too, and sort of point and indicate at stuff. So you're going to, okay, you're going for that guy. All right. Yep. Um, I'm going to suggest that, especially since he hasn't acted yet, he's probably got some cover. Um, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the cover rules here in combat. This, this will be pretty relevant, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and look it up. Cover. I'll I'm going to say her. he's got half cover. It'll give him a plus two bonus to AC and dexterity saving throws. So he's half obscured by a tree trunk or some bushes. Hmm. The, the one in the middle of the road is obviously totally exposed. In that case, I'll shoot him. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll say the three who are still hanging back have that half cover. That won't have any effect in melee. It's only going to be uh, a, an issue in ranged combat. Uh, the attack bonus, is that for damage, or when I do the roll, I can't uh, remember. Attack bonus is for your attack roll, like, to hit. It's your to hit bonus. So you should be getting, what, a plus four or a plus five there? Plus four. Yeah, okay. You're going to be shooting your bow? Yep. Doing the elf thing. All right, give it a spin. Already did. Got a 17. Oh, nice. there, okay. Excellent. Uh, 17 will, uh, will easily hit. These goblins, at least when they're not firing their, uh, their short bow, 
are, are carrying a shield and they also are wearing some some leather armor but it's not necessarily very high quality leather armor so your arrow is easily able to pierce the leather armor and do damage so now roll your damage which i believe will be a d6 um and you'll want to add plus two to that because of your dexterity modifier which i probably didn't include in your character sheet when i made it oh you didn't <clears throat> so yeah d6 plus two Whoa, almost max damage. So your arrow doesn't just like, doesn't just like, you know, poke him in the arm or something like that. You, you draw your bow and you remember you've got like these combat flashbacks. You've got some PTSD going on, uh, but you don't let that, that shake you as you loose the arrow and it flies squarely, hits the goblin in the middle of the chest and he just collapses on the ground dead. One shot, one kill. Nice. Sweet. <laughs> Uh, how do I mark these guys as being dead? There's a... Oh, there we go. That's way better. There we go. X marks the dead goblin. So next in queue would be Portia. However, Portia is still currently surprised from having failed the perception check. Especially per uh, surprised by having this goblin uh, incapably attack her and then suddenly keel over and die. Uh, it, next it's not be... what you expect, honestly. Yeah, no one expects the Spanish goblins. Uh, <laughs> Serafina also surprised. Jaysor also surprised. So next up is goblin number nine. Bump, bump, bump. Um, this this goblin is completely unfazed by the fact that goblin goblin number two there failed to uh, melee attack Portia and is convinced that he can do better. So he is going to run up to Portia over here and also take another slice. 16 is a near miss. You, actually, this is a much more competent attack. You just barely fend it off with your, uh, with your shield. Um, just barely deflect the blow. Literally, because you are using a shield, right? Yes. Yeah. If you didn't have a shield, your AC would actually just be 16. So it would have been a hit. So yeah, you just at the last second, get your shield in the way of the short sword or the scimitar and then block the, the blow. And then that would be Briarstone, but Briarstone is surprised. So now the final goblin in the turn order gets to go, which is the one to the north here. Yes, indeed. And this one is not going to be quite as crazy. No, ay, 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 ay. But instead simply fires her short bow at... Um, I'd say that you've got a good shot against both Perrin and uh, Serafina. So I'm going to roll a d2. On a 1, it's Perrin. Oh, okay, so Perrin is going to get attacked again. A 14 is not enough, so that arrow goes... It actually does hit you, but it's deflected away by your armor. And you take no real damage. And now we're back up to the initiative order, the top of the queue for the second time. Uh, so everyone will be able to act this turn. However, the goblins are still going first, or two of them are. Well, no, sorry. One. There's two people with really good initiatives, but one of them is dead. So it's going to be the goblin to the <laughs> south over here that is actually going to take uh, another shot at... You know what? May as well keep shooting at Perrin. He, uh, he hit her, hit him the first time. So he's going to try again. This one goes wide. That is a clear miss. Next up is dead goblin. Now it's Perrin once again. Hmm. Uh, I yell over to Portia. You want me to shoot him as well? Or you want <laughs> me to shoot one of the other ones? I've got this one. This one's mine. Okay. I'll, I, I'll shoot the boss that actually managed to hit me the first round. The one in the south there, yeah, okay. I'm still going to give that goblin half cover, so I'll get a plus two in his AC, but uh, because he's firing with a short bow, he's not using his shield, so it actually comes out to a wash. Hmm. Hey guys, you guys mm -hmm. are shouting at each other, but meanwhile, in the bush, I shout, why are you guys yelling? Because <laughs> <laughs> apparently, I don't know what the hell's going on yet. Well, you've Where's certainly seen the arrows whiz by at this point. It caught you by surprise. You're like, what? Phew, phew, phew. Oh, what? Okay. Oh, maybe I should actually, you know, take action. Put down these mushrooms and, uh... <laughs> so, uh, Perrin, are you going to roll to hit? Whoa! So that is a nice. natural 20, which is a critical hit, which means you get to roll your damage die twice. 
You still only add your plus two once, but you'll get to roll 2d6 plus two. Natural 20. Uh, sorry, say that again. I got interrupted. Bloody oh. relatives. <laughs> because you rolled a natural 20, that's a critical hit, which means you get to roll your damage twice. You only add your modifier once, so it'll be 2d6 plus 2. If I remember your numbers correctly. Yeah, sounds about right. Boom! Oh my god, and that is a lot of damage. That, like, that arrow, you're, you're the deadliest person in your party. You're like, I'm the cleric, I'm the healer. Ba-doom, 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 ba-doom. So this one, again, squarely hits the goblin in the chest and actually causes it to, like, sail back, like, ten feet from the kinetic energy, just, like, impaling it, and uh, sends it rocking backwards. Another, one, one shot, one kill, or two shots, two kills at this point. You are scary. Nobody messes with the healer. It's like in those movies where you've got, like, the priest character who all of a sudden turns into this, like, insane badass, like, ninja in, in Surprise and, like, those, those cheesy horror movies. Good times. I, I will also note that when you guys have a turn, you guys get three things you can do. You can move up to your speed. You can take a, a sort of a standard action, which is normally an attack, for example. You also do get a bonus action as well. Uh, not everyone's got something they can do in a bonus action. It'll mostly come down to like a few sort of instant cast spells, but uh, some of your classes may have that ability uh, to do something as an instant, as a bonus action, basically. But oh, Heron's yeah. got a pretty good uh, vantage point there. Uh, and as my bonus action, I heal myself with, what was it, a healing word? Healing word, yes. Um, you'll have to check it. I believe it's a d4, and then you get to add something to it, because you've got the cleric of life thing. Let, let's go and double check exactly what it does. It'll be good to know later on when the fights get a little bit more dangerous. This is obviously the warm-up fight. Healing word. It's got a range of 60 feet. It is a bonus action. You merely speak a word and it adds 1d4 plus your spellcasting ability modifier. Your spellcasting ability is wisdom. So whatever your wisdom modifier is. So it's a d4 plus that. And then if I check the fact that you're a cleric of life. Get plus two, I think, on uh, heals. Per level or something, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Whenever you use a spell first level or higher to restore hit points to the creature, the creature regains an additional hit points equal to 2 plus the spell's level. Okay, so here's the thing. You're going to roll a d4. Then you're going to add your wisdom modifier. Then you're going to add 2 and the spell's level. So what's your wisdom modifier? 3. So it, you're going to get a d4 plus 6 hit points. That is an insanely powerful heal, assuming I'm reading all this correctly. A very, very strong. Let's see, I get plus two from the life thing, plus three from the <laughs> wisdom, so that's five. And the life thing is actually two plus the spell's level. It's a level one spell. Oh, okay, so that, yeah, that's plus six, so yep. basically I don't need to roll. <laughs> that's true. And um, uh, El Superbeardo has got it right. Cleric of life kills everything. That's exactly what's going on there. Well, you can you give life and you can also take it away is what it comes down to. All right. Uh, so next up is Portia. Yeah. Plus okay. Nine. Nine health, and I I've lost three. So yeah, <laughs> full health. You actually some of your wrinkles go away. You had a scar from when you hurt yourself when you were a child, and that's that's gone away as well. I'm just gonna keep it simple and attack this goblin who's. Uh... Trying to attack me. Who's all up in your grill? Yep. Oh dear. That is unfortunately going to be a miss. I guess, you know, you're still caught a little bit off guard. You had a bit of, you know, you got your shield up just in time, but uh, you were a bit slow getting your own sword out of your scabbard. And as a result, you weren't able to get a good swing on the goblin who's quite nimble and dodges away from your blow. Okay, says. Seraphina. Okay, um... Yeah, how's how's my cover situation being still inside of the wagon? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say right now because the wagon has obviously sort of a bit of a railing kind of thing. Uh, I would give you uh, you can you can fire from there and get half cover if okay, you've got ranged um, attacks. I do, but I want to jump out of the wagon and move towards the goblin to my northeast. 
Okay, you can easily reach that goblin. Uh, is this position fine for being able to attack it, or do I need uh, to be Absolutely. In? No, you're uh, fine. If you move five feet to the right, you won't obstruct any ranged attacks that I might do with spells where you are right now. I don't think there's going to be much cover uh, from friendly units. Um, I Actually, I'd have to double check the rules in 5th edition, uh, but generally speaking, that's not going to be an issue, especially not with friendly targets. You have to remember, these are five foot squares, so there's actually quite a lot of uh, space around there and the people tend to be dancing around one another. So you're okay. going to have a clear shot. I didn't okay. know if there were obstruction rules or anything. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm going to say no for melee combat, unless there's like a really wonky size difference or something. Yeah, I think there's a... Isn't there a special thing that Lightfoot Halflings get where they can hide behind other people? They, they can hide, and yeah, I would say that that might, so that might apply if, if to cover as well. if that's a special rule, then that indicates that like, other people can't. Well, here's the thing. I think people can hide. Now, hiding is different from cover. People can hide ah. behind things that are two sizes categories larger than they are. Right. And with halflings, right. it's just the one. Um, but I don't know if... Looking. Uh, yeah, creatures count. Um, Let's come on, low wall. I just mean whether the creature is an enemy or a friend. Uh, just, just to make a decision so we can keep the action going faster, I will say that um, the, the two size category for normal people and one size category for halflings. So, as a halfling, Serafina could get cover if she's behind someone of medium size or larger. Uh, but here, everyone's the same size, and I don't think the goblins got that special ability, so we'll say that it's not an issue. So yeah, anyway, Serafina, you can go ahead and attack the goblin with your, your melee attack, I suppose. Are you dual wielding? I am not dual wielding, I'm going to swing at the goblin with my rapier. Okay. Or poke. Poke him yeah, with the pointy okay. bit. Poke it with a stick. All right, well, a 17 is definitely going to be able to hit this goblin, uh, especially since it doesn't have its shield in hand because it's using its short bow. And the fact that it has cover against ranged attacks is not going to apply here against the melee because you're able to sort of get in there around the bush and just uh, stab it directly so that you easily hit the goblin with that. Go ahead and roll your damage. Uh, that's 1d8 and then my attack bonus as well, right? Uh, not your attack bonus, but your ability bonus, your dexterity modifier. Wow, you rolled max damage on that. These goblins are not, you know, I knew they were going to be relatively easy. They're only goblins, but you guys are just like obliterating these things like they're not even there. You just like you just run your, your rapier directly through, uh, you know, right through the throat and then pull it back out. And you do it so quick. The blade is like almost clean when you pull it out. But the goblin just like drops to the ground, gurgling blood and is dead. There's only one goblin remains. And we come to Jasor on a 10 is your action. I think I'm going to Ray of Frost it. Sounds good to me. So I think I have to make an attack you need to chill. roll for that with like my spell attack modifier. Yes, I believe it is a, the, the Ray type attack. And yeah, so you'll be doing your, your proficiency bonus plus your int modifier. Which is what, a plus four, plus five, something like that? There we go, plus five. Yeah, plus five. 17 to hit, easily go. So you just extend an arm, and a ray of frost comes out. And uh, the frost starts to build up on the goblin skin where you hit. How much damage do you make? Um, I make 1d8. I'm not sure if there's any bonuses for that. I don't think so. That's a good question. It's called ray of frost, right? Yeah. Um, no, there's no bonus damage, but its speed is reduced by 10 until the start of your next turn, which is kind of interesting. The damage does scale up as you level up, uh, but it apparently you don't add your int. Oh, wait, you rolled a one? 
Yes. That they is very poor. That is very poor. Everyone's going to laugh at you. You're the only person who didn't one-shot a goblin. You freeze oh. yourself. I see what's going on. You're, you're giving uh, Briarstone, or whatever Briarstone's character's name is, a chance to participate. Just that's, remember, that's really nice. yeah, yeah, it's the participation award for, for Briarstone. I, I'm just being nice, really. Well, thank you. All right, the oh, goblin is slow. Just remember, Magic Bird. That's me. Magic Bird. We should, here, we should rename you. Do people really call you Magic Bird? Yes, that's my last name. Oh, serve all one word, I see. There we go. Magic bird. <laughs> all right, well, we bring up the turn order. Um, oh, the one goblin who's still left alive is the one that's going to try to act. And uh, he actually, like, panics at this point. All of his buddies are dead. He's just been hit by magic. No one wants to mess with that. So he's going to try to run away. Unfortunately, the frost, even though it only did one point of damage, is going to slow him down. So he's going to take a disengage action, which we will uh, check on in a moment here. Let me verify exactly how it works. That means if you I take... don't get an opportunity attack, doesn't it? That's right. So if you take the disengage action, your movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks for the rest of the turn. Because normally, if this goblin were to just move away from Portia, the goblin would, uh, Portia would be able to take a shot um, at him. But he's moving away very carefully, and he's going to try to run. Unfortunately, he's not going to get very far. Uh, he's only going to make it about 20 feet. Why isn't it not... Why isn't it giving me the actual um, counter as I pull? That's kind of annoying. But one, two, three, four. So that'll be 20 feet, and the goblin will make it over there. Yeah, like, I can do the distance measuring thing. But when I'm trying to move, I would like it if it gave me the distance counter at that point. But maybe there's an option for it, and I'm not seeing it. All right. Uh, so now it is... Magic Bird's turn. Fortunately, this <laughs> goblin has exceptionally good cover. Um, he does. You, eh? can, you can still attack. Hmm. Uh, I'm going to say that this counts as three quarters cover, which will give three a plus five cover. bonus to AC. Because he's literally on the other side of a tree. Huh. Doesn't mean you can't hit. Um, you could conceivably move as well. You could move and shoot, and then you'd be okay. Like if you went somewhere like here. Okay, um, what I have to do, honestly, is I have to roll Razzle Dazzle, so... <laughs> Prepare yourself for Razzle Dazzle. Razzle Dazzle. I am going to move, um, I guess I'll go stand on the corpse of this friend. Okay, hold on, I need a little bit of, like, height here. Ugh, squish, squish. <laughs> oh, you're never gonna get that out of your boots. Now I'm gonna have a bird's eye view. Get just, just, just get ready, just get ready, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be great. Right? Of course it is. Roll 1d20. Plus what? Do I get any pluses? Oh, yeah, I do. I get plus 5. That's, wait, or is it plus 5 on damage? Wait. Do you get any pluses to the roll? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your attack bonus, probably okay, plus so 5. Like, what's your dex? Is it 16? Um, no, my dex is 12, so I get plus 1. I'm proficient. So that's plus two. Oh, and you've got the archer plus thing. Two for the... And I get plus two for the archer thing. Because you're a fighter, yeah. Right. So, God, yeah, your so stats are so terrible. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Razzle dazzle <laughs> incoming. Do it. You can do it. Do it. Oh, really? Is that going to uh, And unfortunately, that is... Oh, wait, hold on. No, that's fine. Because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even with the shield up, their AC is exactly 15. Oh, no, he's got, he still has partial cover here. He doesn't have three-quarters cover, but he's got, got at least half cover. So, no, unfortunately, you would have hit him. The shot's going, like, straight for him, and there's, like, one little branch in the way, so your arrow just sticks into that. But it's, like, three inches from the goblin's face. The goblin actually stops for a second. And then, you know, keeps trying to run. All right, then. Um, as a simple action, I stomp on the dead one's head. Ah, oh. now see that, <laughs> that's just mean. <laughs> Come on, that's all I get. As a reaction, I jump out of the way of the splattering blood. That's, that seems like a good idea. I'll, I'll allow it. 
All right, Perrin, you are now up. Yeah, apparently I can't move my character anymore. <laughs> oh, you've got the uh, measuring tool selected right now. You'll have to switch back to the arrow, the moves, the select move oh, arrow. Right. And where the heck was I moving? <laughs> yeah, I know, like, why is it when you move, it doesn't show the guess. distance? Yeah, it's... <clears throat> Whatever uh, oh. I used to use before, the uh, RPG map tools, that's what it does. When you drag your character out, it shows you the distance and the exact path being traveled. Yeah. Uh, does he still have cover for me now? Echo Plume with the Munchkin reference. Nice. Uh, no, I'm going to say you've got a clear shot. You can shoot this tiny, puny, hurt goblin in the back as he's trying to run away. Feel free. Cleric of Warning. Yep, short bow again. Uh, Mason FH. Miss. Oh no! Mason FH in the chat is asking if D and D five has support for hex tile grids. In fact, you don't need to play on a um, a grid at all when you're playing fifth edition D and D. We're using it here as a helpful visual aid, uh, but you can be played entirely in your head, or it can be played with like actual measurements like on a free-flowing thing without grids or you could probably do it with a hex as well why not you, you know just each hex movement is, counts as five or something like that there's no reason you couldn't do it but uh certainly works best on a square grid so uh perrin misses it like it hits the same branch somehow that uh, magic bird just hit you're like i wasn't even aiming anywhere close to there but you missed pretty bad portia portia you are now up you have not okay. yet wet your blade, so it may be your opportunity to do so. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have nothing to do with this fancy shooting at people. I'm just going to run in and, and go for another stab with my rapier. Oh, you also have a rapier. So both I halflings are packing rapier. rapiers. An 11, unfortunately, is not going to cut it. I'm sorry. Cut it, Badoom. Yeah. Oh. Serafina. Maybe, maybe you can show Portia how you use a rapier. I sure I'm going to try this. Stabbing with the pointy bit. That should be 25 feet. Okay. Woof. That is definitely a hit. Oh. So yeah, I should like step in front of like the goblin's still trying to run. I mean, obviously, like it's a little bit fuzzy because of how the turns work. But this is all happening as the turn is the, the, the everything is happening, right? The goblin is running. So Portia is trying to sort of hack at the goblin as it's running and trying to keep pace with it. And Seraphina just like cuts in front of the goblin at some point and just lets the goblin run into the blade. <clears throat> and another big, big damage roll. Wait, that was not. Not a crit this the time. D six is for a sneak attack, so. Oh, that's right. My bad. Because as a rogue, you get the sneak attack whenever you have another ally adjacent to your target in combat. So, not that it would have mattered. Your D eight would have been enough. These goblins only had seven hit points each, so you easily eviscerate this thing. And that is one more dead goblin. So the, uh, the body count is good guys, four, bad guys, zero. Or maybe it's the other way around, depending on how you look at it. But so the combat, I mean, it only, every round is like six seconds. So this whole fight, you know, from like the initial spotting to the end uh, was basically, you know, somewhere in the 12 to 18 second range. This was a brief and very violent skirmish. And you guys easily dispatch the goblins with ease. Easily with ease? Sure, we'll go with it. The only damage that happened to you guys at all, it was in the one very quick sneak attack where um, Parent took a, uh, a glancing arrow blow, but even that's not uh, obvious, unless there's like maybe a tear in some clothing or something. The only evidence remaining of, of the damage. So there you go. Fight's over. What do you guys want to do? Well, I just want to say that I know, I know killing this should never be a competition, but if killing was a competition, I think Parent's winning. It's a tie. Actually, I have two kills on my name now. 
with Parent and Serafina. But it is it is a group game. It's oh. a party type thing. There's team play. You know, obviously that last one was just too distracted by by my blow. Um, well, here's the or thing. It could have been my 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 bolt or yes. something. <laughs> yes, definitely. If, uh, it, it was if, all us and nothing to do with the people who actually got the good rolls. <laughs> if the goblin hadn't been slowed, I think the goblin could actually have stayed out of reach of both the fighter and the thief. I mean, you guys still had plenty of ranged attacks, so you would have been okay there. What's the speed on the goblin? Right, I did check. They have a speed of 30, so... While everyone is shouting and boasting about their attacks, I run to the cart that the goblins had left behind, and I rummaged through it and tried to find any treasure. I actually forgot about a goblin ability as well. The goblin could have uh, taken an attack at you and then still disengaged that turn because they have a special ability to do that, but oh well, it's fine. So who is uh, rummaging through the wagon? That would be Serafina. Serafina, of course the rogue. Of course the rogue. Should have known. So, um, there's, um, there, there's a couple of sacks left in the wagon and uh, some broken down barrels, but as far as you can tell, everything has already been looted. Uh, although, as you're looking around here, you do notice that uh, just on the side of the wagon, there appears to be an empty leather map case. Like, it's a map case, and you pick it up, but it's empty inside. I just randomly walk around and loot the corpses. Loot the corpses. There we go. That is everyone's favorite activity in every role-playing game, paper or otherwise. <laughs> um, so the goblins don't seem to have much on them. They have some, some ratty, stinky, kind of moldy leather armor. Uh, they have some, uh, some sort of beat-up wooden shields that they carry um that you're not even sure that anyone would want to pay for them they have that the rusty scimitars as mentioned they're heavily nicked and rusted um and the short bows technically the short bows are are functional but crude uh they also have arrows so anyone who uses arrows can go and uh, pick up uh we're gonna say there's a total of um of i don't know maybe 10 arrows each minus the ones they've fired uh, plus a few that just don't look high quality enough. So let's say there's a total of 30 good arrows remaining. And that's really the only treasure that um, that you can find on there. It's like a couple of copper coins that one of them had. Um, and one of them has a, a rock. It's clean. It looks like it may have been like polished a little. But as far as you can tell, it's just a rock. Not a gem or anything of that kind. Does the rock have anything to do with religion? Well, why don't you do uh, a wisdom religion roll? Religion is int, I think. Oh, okay. Int. Right, I guess it would be mapping to a knowledge thing. Okay. An int roll. Religion, if you've got the uh, proficiency. Well, that was Ooh. crap. <laughs> a five, uh, yeah. No, you're 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 a hundred percent certain. No, this is just a rock. There's nothing special about this at all. Yeah, uh, it's not even guys, very shiny. Anybody want the arrows? I would like to have a part of the arrows. Hmm. Speaking of arrows, is there any way I can go retrieve my bolt? Can I reuse my bolt? Oh yeah, can we pick up the bolts that are stuck in the tree? <laughs> um, I don't know what the rules like... are, generally speaking, for that. I, I'm, I'll say, tell you what, the uh, the two arrow slash bolts that are uh, stuck in the uh, the tree branch, you guys can recover those. Uh, but other than that, usually a fired arrow or bolt, uh, like breaks or Is becomes expensive. damaged here, just mm, for the, the sake right. of simplicity. <laughs> oh, okay, I I go and retrieve my. My arrow that's next to uh, the bolt, and then I pick up uh, ten more arrows from the corpses. Okay. I'd like to make an arcana check on the rock. Sure, go ahead. God damn it. Critical failure. Um... 
The rock jumps into your eye socket and kills you. Yeah, the, the rock actually, uh, when you look at it, it has an interesting sort of spirally pattern, almost like a helix pattern on it. And uh, you, you suddenly think that this is probably like the most fascinating thing in the world. In fact, uh, you're kind of, you're like, oh, this is probably some sort of fossil, is what this is. Some sort of helix fossil. It's a Pokeball. I try to take the rock from JSOR and stick it in my pocket using my slate of hand. Whoa. Oh. Well, right now, JSOR has got it in his hand, so I'd say that that might be a little bit difficult for it, but are you going to wait until he sort of pockets it or puts it in his, uh, his pouch or something? I will uh, await that then. Okay. And well, you can also send um, direct messages. <laughs> So you might want to do that if you start stealing stuff. <laughs> I, as someone with low wisdom, I, I just figure that it's a lucky rock. But I also figure that given that the goblins have just died, it wasn't really very lucky, so I don't want that. <laughs> it's like the whole rabbit's foot argument. You know, if a rabbit's foot is lucky, what happened to the rabbit? Yep. Yeah. All right. I mean, uh, so now that the, we'll we'll deal with the the sleight of hand of the the rock in a moment here. Once we sort of move away and people become distracted once more. Uh, but what else? What else are you doing with the site here? I I want to see how best to shift this wagon out of the road so that we can carry on. Right. Uh. So. Well, luckily, you, you have some incredibly strong fighters in the party, what with one being a halfling and one having a strength of six. So you have no difficulty whatsoever getting the wagon out of the way. <clears throat> I mean, you know, all, all honestly, outside of combat, it's unfortunately, it's going to be kind of like annoying work because you don't have anyone like... Well, actually, there's a question. How strong is Portia? Uh, strength is 13. Oh, that's, that's actually pretty good, uh, certainly. It's actually not that hard, especially with some help, to uh, write the wagon back up. This is not a very big wagon, so you're able to get it righted. And then while the win uh, one of the wheels is definitely smashed up, uh, like the, the, the rim of it is pretty broken, uh, technically you can still sort of half roll the thing on three wheels just off the side of the road. And uh, I mean, it takes several minutes to get everything organized and going there. Maybe use some rope for some extra leverage to get it to tip over and then uh, pull it out of the way. Uh, but you can you can relatively easily clear the road. Very good. So I suppose we're back on the road again. On the road again. Sorry, I'll stop. <clears throat> Just can't wait to get on the road again. Yeah, sounds, sounds good to me. Same marching order as before. Yeah, I jump back on the wagon and coerce the mm. oxen to start moving again, I guess. Okay. So you guys, well, you guys leave the area. I'm just thinking, um, did, do I have a horse or was I on foot? I wasn't actually clear on that. And you guys are all on foot. Okay. You so are I'm poor just level one adventurers with no horses. If I could. What's that? Now that we've... I'm going to go tree to tree or bush to bush now that we've seen combat. I'm just going to do like uh, William Shatner rolls. Did anyone take the map case? Just for flavor. Because now I'm all wary. <laughs> uh, Quill, in yeah. the basic rules, it says um, you can recover half of your ammunition at the end of every battle by taking a minute to search the battlefield. So Awesome. That, that sounds great. All right, As so you, found... you guys are leaving. Did anyone take the map case? I found it and I pocketed it without okay. anyone, I guess. You pick it up and put it in your purse. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, let's leave. All right. You get head back down the road to Fandalian. We've got to make that dollar. <laughs> so I got to skip ahead a little bit here. All right. <clears throat> so you guys travel. It's, again, about another half a day on the road. 
The, uh, the rutted track emerges from a wooded hillside, and you catch your first glimpse of Fandalen. The town consists of 40 or 50 simple log buildings, some built on old field stone foundations. More old ruins, crumbling stone walls covered in ivy and briars, surround the newer houses and shops, showing how this must have been a much larger town in centuries past. Most of the newer buildings are set on the sides of the cart track, which widens into a muddy main street of sorts as it climbs towards a ruined manor house on a hillside on the east side of town. As you approach, you see children playing on the town green and townsfolk tending to chores or running errands at shops. Many people look at you as you approach, but all return to their business as you go by. And I have a picture of Fandalian. It's pretty low res. But there we have it. Well, it's a small town. Yep, like 40 or 50 houses, that's it. But yeah, there's tons of ruins around. Obviously, sometime long ago in the past, there was another city here, a much larger city. Uh, and the site has sort of been reclaimed recently. People setting up farms and, and whatnot. Um, and, you know, especially with the remnants of the walls, there's the idea that um, defensive barricades and things could be reset up and uh, um, it would turn into a pretty good site. Does anybody have a knowledge history um, why it was abandoned the first time? It's an interesting question. I mean, uh, I could roll for it, but I have a negative one to my roll. Yeah, I would also have a negative one. I would have no a plus bonus. three. There, 14 history roll. 14 is not bad. I do believe there's a specific section of text that I can be given you, but... And with the 14 especially, it's a good question. Exactly how much would you know with the 14? Well, with the 14, you basically know what I have told you. The town was actually relatively successful. Um, you, think, you think there might have been some mining here in the past. Uh, something like that kind of rings a bell. And uh, you know that... Um, uh, it was like a highly multiracial town. Um, dwarves, halflings, humans, some elves, not, not as much, but uh, certainly a lot of that sort of living in harmony, working uh, together. And uh, you think it was um, just sort of like uh, brigands? No, no, you, maybe orcs. Yeah, maybe orcs, like a big orc attack sort of swept through the area and uh, basically took out the town and it was kind of an abandoned after that. And you're not sure how long was it like? A hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, you're, you're really not sure what the number is there. But it was something like that. It was a pretty successful uh, area uh, at the time. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. I'm glad it's not undead. Troubleman72 uh, says that he blames fracking as the problem. Fracking can do it. Yeah, that, that would be it. <laughs> it's not just, not just fracking, magical fracking. It's like 20 times worse. That's true, actually. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the town is small. There's, there's plenty of people around. Where do you guys, what are you guys heading to? You're looking around, you're talking to people, you're asking people for directions somewhere. You know who that you have to get, get to Bar... Sorry, what's that? Go on, who do we have to get to? Uh, you know you're supposed to go to Barthen's Provisions to drop off your cargo, for example. Barthen's um, Provisions. Beyond that, well, you, you can probably first guess first that the town has an inn. First people we see, I would ask how to get to this Barthens Provisions. Sure, no problem. Um, so uh, Barthens is, is the, like the biggest trading post in Fandalen. Uh, it, it's a pretty a prominent building, actually. It's um, uh, so you you ask you ask I don't know a, a passerby, someone is hauling. Um, he's got a wheelbarrow with. Uh, I don't know, some, some wood, some uh, firewood in it. And you sort of flag him down as he's going by. 
and you ask him for directions and he just points you up the road there's a pretty big building there there's a couple of carts a couple of wagons parked outside um and sort of uh just behind it you can see that there's probably like a large storage barn or something like that and uh he indicates that that's barthen's provisions right over there you can get pretty <laughs> much anything much. you want there. thank you that's very helpful um just as a quick aside i'm not sure how the passive wisdom thing goes and if it is at all possible to not have to roll, obviously, because I don't want to take the time to do that. Um, but as we ask questions, like any questions, but specifically that sort of question, just in case um, there might have been someone expecting or someone else expecting this arrival besides the person who would indeed want it. Um, I just want to see if, if anybody's looking shifty in the crowds, anybody nearby, anybody's looking or talking or whispering or anything like that. Hmm. That's an interesting question. What is your yeah. uh, passive perception? Uh, it's only 12. It's 15. Tell you what, everyone can do a perception roll right now. Mm, okay. Or you can. You're specifically looking for shifty people. I will let you make I an am. active per perception roll. Okay. Uh, I'll do that. And then otherwise, we'll keep using the passive because it's a, it's a good thing to know. But we'll go ahead. I'll give you specifically an active one. I'm going to tell you this. You're going to need more than 15. Uh, no. I'm rolling really crappy. That was, that was a really uh, excellent idea, though. Uh, Quill, does yeah. my proficiency add to the passive one? Yes. In that case, I have a passive one of 17. How? Uh, my passive wisdom perception is 15, and I'm profic proficient in perception. Well, yeah, but your passive wisdom of 15, that must include your plus 2 from being proficient. Yeah. Because there's no way you have a, a wisdom of 20. Yeah. No, I have a wisdom of 16. Yeah, so you're getting plus 3 from your wisdom, and then a plus 2 because you're proficient. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, so you've got the 15. Which is very good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you've got directions to Barthen's provisions. Is there anything else you want to ask this fellow while you've got him stopped or anything like that? Or are you just going to move? No, no, I, I, I just want to thank him for the, for the help. And then we'll, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we'll head on up to uh, Barthen's provisions. Okay. So, so wait, um, we should probably discuss the map we found like should like it doesn't seem like anything important but if somebody asks if we found a map should we tell them just mm, because the map case was empty yeah you found a map case but there's no map inside ah uh, but mm. i mean you might still want to have that discussion what i'm going to suggest we do because we've been playing for about an hour and a half we will take a brief pause so people can uh either input or output liquids as required. Yay! Urination. And we'll be back in uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes, all right? All right, cool. we'll be right back. All right, folks. Okay, then. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. Also, leave a comment. Did you know I read every single comment someone leaves on my video? That's insane. Why would I do that? I don't know, but I'll read yours.